Good afternoon here in the United States and good evening in the United Arab Emirates. We are particularly glad today to be able to welcome you to a very special AMET webinar. We are profoundly and deeply honored to be able to welcome as our esteemed guest, His Excellency, Dr. Ali Rashid al Nuami. Um, Dr. Ali is an esteemed member of the United Emirates uh, Arab Emirates Federal National Council, uh, representing um, the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. Um, and he is chairman within the council, which is their parliament, of the committees of defense, um, interior, and foreign affairs. Um, Dr. Ali comes to us with more than 30 years of academic and professional achievements within government and within the private sector not only within the Emirates, but throughout the world. Beyond that, His Excellency is also chairman of the Hadaya Center, the International Center for Fighting Violent Extremism. The Hadaya Center opened in 2012, a full eight years prior to the signing of the Abraham Accords last September, showing just how ahead of the curve his and the thinking of his peers at the Hadayar Center has been. His Excellency, first off, I would like to stress once again what a profound honor and privilege it is to welcome you here with us today and to thank you for your time. Um, my, fir my first question to you is, um, why do you think um, it was a, a good thing for the Emirates to sign the Abraham Accords with the State of Israel. Well, Sarah, first, thank you very much for inviting me to, to be part of this. It's a real honor. And uh, actually, uh, I feel it's, it's, uh, it's one of my, my role to, to talk about the Abraham Accord uh, to promote what we worked in the last 30s in the UAE uh, as a priority, uh, working on promoting coexistence value and countering extremism and hate. And here, you know, I, 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 if you let me just, I, you know, I, I'll go a little bit, little bit, talk about where do I come from? As you mentioned, I am an academician by training. Uh, I work in the largest public university and I stepped down before two years as the chancellor of that university. I spent my whole life in that university. Before 30 years, I noticed some radical ideas within some of my students and some of the faculty. And that's where I started, you know, countering these ideas at the, at the beginning. Later on, I found out that I'm, I'm countering an ideology not only within the UAE uh, and not only within the region, but globally. And here where in the UAE, we were fortunate to have the right, the right leadership who had the courage to come forward and you know, push for you know, making the UAE a role model for the region. Uh, Sarah, you have to bear in mind, we are part of an unstable region. We are a small country, uh, you know, as a country, we are only 50 years uh, old. We just got our independence in 1971. Before that, we had nothing in this area, you know. Uh, I was born in a house, there is no electricity, you know, no water, no even toilet. So you have to understand when you look at the UAE, the way, the long way that we came in developing this model in this region. This is why I strive you know, to fight for this model. It's not a model of a structure of having the best uh, highways and the best towers in the world. No, it's, it's what I am proud of is, is, is the outcome that we have of UAE youth. Uh, before five weeks, I met uh, a rabbi who came from Brussels and it was his first visit to the UAE. And I met him on her, his third day. And you know, rabbi, you know, the way he looked, I said, what, what, what's the unique thing that you saw in the UAE? He said, Ali, when I came I, in Dubai airport, I saw those young 
boys and girls, Emirati, looking at me, welcoming me, saying shalom, smiling. I was, I was really pleased. But I thought it was their job to welcome people at the airport. The next day I went to the mall and I saw those young Emirati looking at me and smiling, saying shalom, welcoming me. <laughs> the third day, the same thing. Ali, I felt that their smile is from their heart. It's deep inside. And looking at a rabbi, you know, in a mall, people, they go there for shopping, for entertainment. But because the way I look, you know, I, you know, they, I got their attention. They, they look at me and they say, Salam, welcome, welcome to the UAE. You know, this is, I felt, I felt I am very safe here. I told him, look, this is what we are proud of. That our youth, our boys and girls, we invested in them through our educational system, through, you know, our uh, religious institution, through the media, you know, we change everything to have this outcome that kids who are really, who believe in, in human values that bring people regardless of their religion, their nationality, their ethnic, their color together. This is what we are proud of. So this is why, you know, we, we are, you know, on board of any engagement that will bring people together because we see that coexistence is our path to the future. We see that the diversity that we have in the UAE is a source of strength, not a source of threat. And this is why, you know, we are always proactive to engage other. Uh, you know, uh, Sarah, I was one of the first who were engaged with many Jews friends from outside the UAE who will come to the UAE. You know, AJC, I, I used to meet them whenever they come to the UAE from 2012. And I always send the right message. The UAE is open for everyone. Uh, you know, uh, after the, the announcement of Abraham Accord, the, we have a small Jewish community here. They, they invite me on Zoom. So they said, Ali, are you willing to come forward and talk? I said, of course, 100%. And, you know, they invited many friends from all over the world, from the Jewish community. My message to them was this. I want you to know this, that you, as a Jewish community, you are welcome in the UAE. We will open for you our heart before we open our, our houses for you. Uh, we feel that we need you to be part of our community more than you think that you need, we, you need us to welcome you. So feel safe, you know, you are part of us. We want you to be not only part of our present, but also part our, of our future. Sarah, our generation, my generation in the whole region was a victim, a victim of war, a victim of hate, a victim of extremism. And we felt in the UAE, you know, a game has to be changed and our leadership, had the courage actually to move forward. And when they say the opportunity, they didn't miss it. They took it and the people were on board with them. What is so beautiful about your words is that first of all, you are concentrating on the youth and what is innate in every human being that they're born with a potential to be something beyond um, just a little pawn of the powers that be, as Nasser had said, all of you uh, Egyptians are bullets in the war machine. No, people have to actualize their potential. And I love this. And I, I, this is really what true peace is all about. It, true peace is also about people to people relationships, not just as President John F. Kennedy said, it doesn't just depend on signed documents and treaties alone, but what's in the hearts and minds of the people. Um, and you, and in your institute, the Hadea Institute, has been focusing on this for so many years. And that's why I am much, much more hopeful um, for the, the peace between 
the Emirates and the Bahrainis um, and you know Morocco and Sudan, um, then unfortunately let the peace between Jordan and Israel, which does not seem to be a flowering of this sort of relationship. Um, but let's focus on the positive um, instead of the negative today. And um, I was delighted to read that the Emirates has, have just invested $10 billion in Israel. Um, could you tell us a little bit about this? Well, you see, I'll tell you about this, but there is more things that I, I need to tell you about. <laughs> you know, first, uh, you know, I was uh, one of the people who talked to the first official delegation that the Israeli delegation who came to the UAE on uh, September 13th before the signing of the accord by two days. And, you know, I gave a speech there to them, to that official delegation. I told them, I have three messages for you. The first one, please don't compare the UAE treaty with Israel with what you had with Egypt or with Jordan. It's different. Our, our treaty, it's not a peace between the government. It, it is a peace between the government the people, the private sector. It's a one way to go. There is no way back. You know, when we talk ab our, about peace, we talk about it from our heart. We believe that all of us are winner in peace, no loser in peace. But in war, you know, uh, there, there is no winner at the end because even if you have wars, at the end, you will sit at the negotiation table looking for peace. Why we do have to wait? Let's move forward and engage in peace. This is what we are doing. So I, my message to you, don't compare what happened between you and Egypt with us. You will see not only the government, the people, they open their heart and mind to engage with the Israeli people. This is the first message. The second message, you know, between any government, there is, there is many sector in their relation, the political one, the economic, you know, the technology, the health, the academic, the culture, all these things. I told them, look, we will have full relation in all these area, but you have to understand this the way that we think in the way. We know when it comes to the political file, there will be up and down. There will be things that we will agree upon, things that we will disagree. But I want to assure you this, that will not affect our economic relation, our cultural relation, our academic relation. You know, the full engagement that we will have will not be impacted by a disagreement in a certain area in, in a political file. When, when it, whenever there is an issue, we will sit together, talk about it. You know, uh, either we will convince you or you will convince, uh, convince us or we put it aside and move forward. Right. And, you know, this is, this is the, the, the second message. The third message I told them, look, there is a great opportunity now that we, the Israeli and the Emirati, we can create a new narrative to approach whom? To target the Palestinian youth, yes. the Palestinian women, create a convincing narrative, a convincing message to them that will gain their heart and their mind. You see, I don't want to waste my time with the Palestinian leadership because they have their political agenda. But at the end, the one who are suffering is the Palestinian people. You know, Abbas refused our aid for COVID-19 because it's, you know, it came through Bungorian airport. He didn't care about the people who are dying, you see. Hamas is, is hijacking 2 million Palestinians to serve their terrorist agenda. You see, they don't care about these people. So we need, I told them, to, to, to develop uh, a narrative. We will work with you together to approach the youth, engage them, that the only path that we all have is peace and peace for all. And that peace will add value to them and the hope that we all have is only through peace. This is what I did in, 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 in that uh, meeting. And uh, I see the outcome of that. So this is why, you know, 
the announcement of, of the $10 billion investment in, in, in Israel. This is part of the things that we are doing to show not only the Israeli, the region and the world, there is no way back. Peace is here to stay. And we, we, want, we are investing in the message to gain the heart and the mind of the youth, the Israeli, the Palestinian, the Arab. This is our way, our path to the future. I could not be more grateful. And um, I have been watching since 1993 when the leaders of the Palestinian Authority have been indoctrinating these precious youth with the message of incitement and hatred to murder um, Israelis. And, they, and if, we, if there is a way to work on some kind of um, way to beam television shows into the Palestinian Authority, where we could counter that negative indoctrination with the beautiful positive message that you bring to the region and to the world. It would be wonderful, really wonderful, really. So now I am going to open up the podium to our wonderful um, director of um, Israel's pro uh, Emet's program for Israel's national security, Benjamin Whale. Benjamin? Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, and thank you very much, Dr. Nuemi, for, for your remarks. Um, there are a number of questions that came in, and I'll, I'll begin with the first one. If some Western analysts reduced the Abraham Accords to merely a strategic pact to counter the Iranian threat, is there more to the Abraham Accords than confronting Iran? You know, Benjamin, let me frame this in th this way. If we did this, uh, treaty with Israel 30 years ago or 25 years ago, you will see millions demonstrating in Cairo, in Amman, in Beirut, in many Arab cities. We didn't see that. The, 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 the region has changed. I hope you see, especially our you know, friends in the West, especially in the US, they have to understand you see, the, the way that they, they approach the region uh, in the last 30 years, they, need, they have to change it. You know, the youth in this region, uh, they need some hope. They need the right messages to come, even, you know, when it comes to the, the new administration, Biden administration. They are using the same messages that they use to, to have from these admi the, any administration in the White House. You know, uh, the, a, a message that always talk to the government, a message that, you know, try to balance the, 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 the political relation with the, with, uh, with, between the power in the region. Uh, but they, they ignore that things have changed with what the social media in every house, in, in, in the, in, not only in the Arab world, you know, uh, in the world, people you know, are engaging in these and uh, in analyzing these messages and responding to it. So they have to understand now the region has changed. We believe that the announcement of the Abraham Accord came the right time to send the message to the political leaders in the region and in the world. People here in the region, they need peace. And they are willing, you know, to take the risk of peace rather than that taking the risk of, of wars and, 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 and terrorism and being a victim of extremism, hate, and terrorism. So the Abraham Accord, I think it's the first thing that we in the UAE see it, we, it's a message of peace. Even to the Iranian people, you know, when we announced this on August 13, I was on the Israeli TV and they asked me this question. I said, look, this is a message of peace. We, we want peace for the Iranian people. The Iranian people are the real victim of their regime of what's happened. It's not, it's not only the region who are suffering because of that regime. You know, it's the Iranian people. And we, we, we have a history with them. We want them to enjoy what we are enjoying. You know, we want the Iranian people to be part of the world, to be part of the 21st century to see the added value of engaging and investing with the world and believing in the, in the human value and common value that we share as human beings. So our, our vision 
it's not, you know, we are not, you know, uh, engaging in this accord because, because we want to target Iran. No, we want to create a new path for the whole region, including for the Iranian people, that peace is the only option that we have. And, and to that extent of the Abraham Accords, uh, are the Abraham Accords going to survive outside pressers to uproot it? Um, there were concerns that a change in an administration, whether it's here in Israel or elsewhere in the Middle East, that that would maybe change the nature of, of the, the peace accords and normalization. Um, but uh, do you believe that outside pressers or any pressure will uh, change um, the Abraham Accords? You see, although the leaders who signed the accord, you know, it's part of their history, you know, it, it's part of something that they are proud of. It's not limited to them. Now it's part of the people. The Israeli people, they say, they saw the added value of having this accord. You know, in December, we had in Dubai about 130,000 Israeli. You know, this is, this is something that we are proud of. And at the same time, the UAE, many UAE nationals are eager to visit Israel, but because of the COVID-19 restrictions, they are not, but they are engaging in so many activities. Online, you will see them in the clubhouses, you will see them uh, in, in, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Snapchat, Instagram. The engagement between the people is more than you can imagine. And it is, it is you know, it is, is in a speed that the government can't catch with them. This is where it's not, you know, this treaty, Although those leaders signed it, it's, it's not their ownership. It, it's not, they don't own it. The people own it now. And the people saw the added value. And the, we all, every day we see more engagement from NGO, from uh, private sector, from uh, public figures, and from nor normal people in that regard. So there is no way back. It's, 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 it will be my, my assurance and my belief, you know, it will flourish. But we have to keep the momentum, work hard on it, and we shouldn't, and this is very important, we shouldn't lay, leave a, a vacuum or space for those terrorist organizations to fill a vacuum. Frankly, you know, after the new administration came into the White House, they sent different messages to the region. Unfortunately, the Muslim Brotherhood tourist organization, their member, they read they that message in a different way. This is why they form new organization against what? Against normalization with Israel. You know, in the UAE, we have some of these members who are escaped, who are residing in Turkey, some of them in London. They form the Emirati resistant organization for normalization with Israel. And others, they form the Gulf uh, Organization for Resisting the Normalization with Israel. So I believe that our friend in the White House, in the new administration, in the uh, State Department, they have to understand whatever they say, it's not a message to the politician and to the government in the region. It's a message that's read with, with you know, from everybody, from the general public and they saw a message that they th thought that there is a, an opportunity for them. This is why they formed this organization. You will see them in clubhouse every day. They create a room, you know, to gather the momentum, you know, and, and promote their narrative against what we are doing. This is because they got the wrong messages from the new administration. And whether the UAE intended for this or not, but they set an example to many other countries across the region who did not have official ties with Israel, uh, but were taking steps to get closer. And the question is, does the UAE plan to lead the region as a whole to, uh, to moderation and away from the toxic ideologies, or are the efforts mainly concentrated uh, domestically? Well, no, you see, you know, I, I mentioned that we did it internally, but, you know, uh, we, we work on the region, we work globally. Uh, our strategy, you know, the terrorism threat 
is a threat to the world. And no single nation will be by itself able to counter terrorism. And you will not be able to counter terrorism unless you go to the root and counter extremism and hate. And this is something that you have to do globally because with, 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 with the social media, with the internet, you know, there is no boundary. You know, you see our, our plane fly everywhere. Even the ideas now, there is, you can't you control the idea, you know, from, you know, spreading over the social media, over the internet. So our strategy is to be proactive, engaging in, in promoting coexistence value and countering hate. And never, never leave a vacuum or a space because those who are promoting hate will fill that vacuum or a space. In your opinion, what is preventing Saudi Arabia from following the UAE's footsteps and joining the Abraham Accords? Uh, look, first you have to understand uh, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia went through huge change in the last six years, you know. I know, you know, personally what, what they are doing. They came a long way. Uh, they, are, they are not away from what we are doing, actually. But you have to understand, because they have Mecca and Medina, there is a responsibility, you know, for all Muslims. There is 1.7 million Muslims who are, you know, watching Saudi Arabia. So they, are, they have to be very careful in their step because other like Erdogan will take the opportunity to attack them and try, you know, to undermine their security and their stability by saying, well, they don't deserve to rule Mecca and Medina because they are making treaty with Israel. But you have to understand this. When we did announce the peace treaty on August 13, the Saudi media, the official one, and the social media, all of them, they were so very supportive of us. They engaged, they counter, you know, the narrative that was created by those who were opposing the peace treaty. So, you know, they won't do that unless there is a blessing to, to do so. so. So I am very optimistic, but we have to be realistic. You know, uh, they, they are, on board, but you, we have to understand the situation that they are in. And uh, with the UAE and Israel, or even Israel with all the other uh, countries that are part of the Abraham Accords, there are some political differences, but all of the countries decided to focus on the uh, mutual benefit of the Abraham Accords and establishing these ties, the economic one, prosperity, welfare, etc. Uh, do you believe that if the Palestinian Authority were to adopt a similar approach towards Israel and focus more on the common good and the economic benefit and welfare that uh, Israel and the Palestinian Authority can reach a true meaningful peace through that avenue as well? Frankly, I don't trust the current Palestinian leadership. I don't trust them. I, you know, uh, when I was on, on, on the Israeli channel and also the Palestinian channel, I was straightforward, very open. I said this leadership is using the Palestinian people as a tool to serve their agenda. They don't care about the Palestinian lives, you see. So I don't, tr I don't trust them. But, you know, when, when, we, when we encourage other countries to focus on other relation with Israel on the economic, on the culture, on the religious. We want to build the bridges of trust. You know, we've been suffering of a narrative in the last 70 years, which, which is, you know, separated us, you know, which is created hate and fear. You no, know, each one is fearing the other side. We want them to sit together, engage, uh, you know, in a relation that will build bridges of what? Of respect, trust, and for sure that will lead, you know, to working together. And whenever you create these common interests, at the end, we all will be one front. So you spoke about trust and earlier we spoke about um, uh, further prospects of, uh, for the Abraham Accords, such as Saudi Arabia. 
What about Qatar, who has cooperated with Israel for a number of years and has that foundation of trust? Um, will Qatar sign the accords as well? And if so, what timeline do you give that, um, that development? Well, I think the, the one who should answer this is, is, is uh, the American administration, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I wish they sign and they come forward. My concern is this that they are still promoting the hate narrative in the region. You know, uh, if you remember when they, when we had uh, when Kushner arranged for the economic summit in Bahrain, you know, and it failed. Uh, I met one American official at that time, and he said, Ali, I have a question for you. Why did summit, this summit fail? I said, well, the day you announced that there is a summit that will be in Bahrain, you didn't watch Al Jazeera. From the first day, every day in the news, they are saying that those who will go to that summit, you know, they are supporting the Zionists. They are supporting Israel, you know, they are betraying the Palestinian, you know. And, you know, I know, I know personally many businessmen from the UAE, from Bahrain, from Saudi, even from Egypt. They, they went to attend the summit. But when they came and they saw that day the narrative that coming from Al Jazeera and other platforms, they didn't want the, their picture to be seen as part of that summit. Because of what? Because of the fear that they saw that, you know, it's, 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 it's what we, 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 we call it, you know, showing, showing them to their family, to their friends, to their customer in a different way, you know. So the main challenge that we have now is, is to stop the hate narrative, you know. Don't believe in uh, press releases and conferences. We want a real act through changing the educational system, the curriculum, you know, changing the narrative that will, is coming from the religious leaders. You know, when we, we announced this, uh, the Abraham Accord, there, there is a, an organization based in Qatar called the Muslim uh, Elders or the Union. They issue what we call a fatwa against us against the UAE, against all those who will work for peace, you see. And they use what? They use religion. It's a political, you know, view, but they use verses of the Quran, you see the saying of the prophet. And you see, this is what create hate actually, you know. So I believe it's, it's not the, the, the one who should answer a question. I think it's a message from the new administration to stop hate for them and for others. And, and you spoke of Al Jazeera. How is the UAE able to protect its population from the influence of the Muslim Brotherhood? And how can we replicate that experience uh, with the rest of the Muslim world? You see, uh, first, we walk the talk in the UAE. People, you know, saw what we, by their eyes, the commitment of the leadership, the investment of the leadership in, in the people, in women, in youth. And, you know, because I mentioned to you, you know, we start working with the educational institution. We, we clean the mess, you see, within our curriculum, the faculty that teach in our university, teacher and principal working in our schools, imam that preaching in the mosque, we make sure that they follow our narrative, a narrative that promote existence, a narrative that promote respect for others. And, you know, we protect that by changing our laws and legislation. You know, anyone can, it's a freedom of speech, but there is no freedom of speech if you can start attacking other religion. It's not accepted by law. You know, the government will take action. So. We, we came a long way in investing in this. And, you know, the people, not only in the UAE, you know, there is a survey that's done by many institutions in the last five years for the Arab youth. 86% of them, they wish 
that they can move and live in the UAE. Because, you know, they see by their eyes what's the outcome of our system, actually. In America, we have a lot of uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Israel and Muslim Brotherhood influence in the BDS movement on campuses uh, and also in uh, U.S. Congress. Can the UAE help the American Jewish community in pushing back on, on this indoctrination uh, of American youth? Uh, before before three weeks, I was uh, I joined a, uh, a room in Clubhouse, uh, hosted by one Jews American, and there was a Holocaust survivor talking about his experience. So when they saw me by this address in the room, they invited me <laughs> to come and talk. So uh, I said first, you know, I really I'd like to thank him for having the courage and to come forward and share his story. But I have a question. You know, this tragedy, which is, I don't, I don't look at it as a Jews only, it's a human tragedy, happened, you know, before 70 years. And in many countries and internationally, we, there is a lot, a lot many laws you know, criminalizing those who, who what? Who don't, you know, who are arguing about the Holocaust and who are believing it or, or you know, engaging any, any thought about it uh, positively. And there is many conferences. My question is this, why didn't we meet our goals? Why Europe, where the Holocaust happened, still Jews are suffering? Why the hate there is flourishing? It's not conferences, it's not laws. We need to do something different. I don't have the answer right now, but we have to think about that. You know, uh, you know this rabbi from Brussels, he told me, look Ali, I feel much safer here than I, in, my, in my city where I was born in Brussels. You know, many friends, many Jews friends in, in Germany, they are telling me, look Ali, you know, we can't walk sometimes in certain area because we feel we are not safe there. It's our city, we were born there. But because of the head narrative that's flourishing, you know, we don't feel safe. I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's an issue that we need, we need to engage in a dialogue with public figures, with NGO, investing in, in, in in, uh, in the youth, in women organization, uh, in you know, uh, academic institution, university, uh, letting the new generation hear you know, the, 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 the added value that they will have if we promote coexistence rather than promoting hate. You know, the threat that I'm seeing because I work in Hidaya now, that in many, many European officials, they are telling me, and American. Ali, you have to focus now on the far, far right because there is serious threat to what? To the stability of the community, you see, because of what they are bringing. So I think, I think it's not, it's not a, an option for us to work on this or not. It's not an option for us to, not to join resources and efforts and work together and we have to work globally, not only in, 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 in the US. We have to, you know, try to gain the heart of, and the mind of those uh, who have great influence on people to engage in this everywhere. Uh, we have to use religious leaders, academicians, women, youth, public figures, you know, to be part of it. It's not only the government. And speaking of creating this positive energy or inertia, what was the element in the Trump administration that made this treaty possible as opposed to prior administrations? Uh, and how can we rep replicate that, um, that component in the uh, government into the private sector as well or into the um, semi-private uh, sector of NGOs? Now one thing about you know Trump administration, they always think, they used to think outside the box. They don't follow the book. This is one thing. And when we 
saw the announcement of the annex, you know, by Prime Minister Netanyahu. We in the UAE, we saw an opportunity. We saw an opportunity that if we didn't take advantage of that opportunity, the region, not the Israeli and the Palestinian only will suffer. The whole region will suffer. So we thought it's the right time, you know, to make a move. And our move was actually first to approach the Israeli public by the article that wrote by our ambassador to DC. And the way that the general public in Israel you know, reacted to that article, sent a message to the Israeli government and to the American. They saw that. And here where Kushner, you know, took the opportunity and we were engaged first with the American and then with the Israeli. Look, we shouldn't miss this opportunity. Let's work on it. And that the way the deal came. So this is why I'm saying the, the new administration and even the European government, they shouldn't deal with the region as business as usual as they used to deal 30 or 40 years ago. The region has changed. They need a new approach. They need a new policy. They have to look. When they look at the region, it's not only having uh, bringing uh, Iran to the negotiating table. The first priority that they have to focus on it is to promote the peace initiative in the region, to invest in the Abraham Accord, to make this, is, this a platform for all nations to come forward. And this is why I want to mention this. Even I mentioned the European government, because unfortunately their reaction to the Abraham Accord is according to the old policy. This is why they, they say it's a great fight, the Palestinian and they have, they have right. You know, the message they are sending to the Palestinian leadership, do business as usual. I think their message should be, you, the leadership, the Palestinian leadership to, should come to negotiate the negotiation table. And this is an opportunity, opportunity you shouldn't miss it. And uh, before I ask the next question, we've been receiving not questions, but just comments by many viewers um, who are very inspired by everything you've been saying right now and are very impressed with the rhetoric that, uh, uh, that, that uh, you're projecting right now. So I'll just mention that we have many viewers who w wish to say thank you to you for all your, your remarks right now. So, uh, but uh, and then the next question is, you mentioned Jewish friends in various countries in your remarks. How did you befriend so many Jews and acquire your welcoming pro-Jewish and pro-Israel perspective? Well, uh, you see, because I'm an academician uh, and in academia, you deal with people regardless of their religion and their nationality. I'll tell you this story. You know, in, in, in mid 90, there was a new initiative in academia called Active Learning. And the guy who was behind this idea is a professor at uh, Michigan State University. So I wanted him to come and do a workshop for my faculty uh, because I read about you know, this uh, and I attended a, co a conference in the US. So when I came, I, you know, I did the search and I found out that he's the guy who behind this idea. So I sent him an invitation to come to uh, UA University and do some, you know, special training for our faculty for three days. And so he responded, he said, Ali, thank you for inv your invitation, but uh, you have to understand that I am Jew. I said, so I responded, well, I am inviting you not to lecture about Judaism, but I'm inviting you as an academician to come and train my faculty in active learning. So he was shocked by my response and then you know, I told him, can I call you? He said, yes. So I called him. He said, Ali, I really appreciate your invitation. But this is the first time that someone from the Arab world talk with me like this. My wife is saying, you know, I said, look, why don't you come and bring your wife with you? <laughs> <laughs> I insisted. But at the end, he said, I can't. It's a very risky. That, you know, that was about 96. So uh, the way that, you know, I, I look into things that I don't, 
you know, I look into the person as a human being. And this is the way here in the UAE, we see people, you know, we are a very diverse community. We have Hindu, we have Buddhist, we have Christian, we have Jews, you know, you name them. Uh, and our relation with them, you know, they even sometimes, if they have issue between them, they trust us. I, I'll tell you this. There is a, an issue happened between, in, not in the UAE, in, in, in the region, in a country, between the churches. Uh, you, you know, these Catholic church and uh, the Orthodox uh, Evangelical, they fought about certain issue. And then I received a call by a priest. Uh, he said, Ali, we need your help. I said, okay, what kind of help? He said, we, we have an issue here and we want you to come because we, all of us trust you because you are from the UAE. I said, come on, you are a Christian. You want me to come and, and solve your problem? It's your, you have solved it, solve it between you. He said, Ali, we don't trust each other. Please come, we trust you. <laughs> so I went there, I sat with them, we engaged in, in a dialogue and at, at the end we came to an agreement. So this is, we, we don't look at, Religion that will, something will divide us. This is why I invested in, 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 in bringing religious leaders together because you can't neglect them. They have a role to play. If you don't bring them forward to bring the right role, they will play a bad role that will hurt you. And each community, you have to look at the religious leaders in a way, bring them on board, engage them, don't let them feel that they are left behind because you will not succeed without them. And, and uh, if you can uh, explain a little bit more about this initiative of yours, uh, some, some of the viewers have asked about it um, to explain exactly what it is you do and, and what ideas you promote. Uh, you mean about the religious leaders or what? Yes. The Hadaya Center. The Hadaya Center. Okay. okay, Hidaya first. Hidaya Center is an international center. Uh, it was established by the GCT Act, the Global Forum for Counting Tourism, which is uh, which was established by 29 countries plus the EU and uh, the US, uh, Russia, China, India, European Union, Canada, Australia, UAE, Egypt. Algeria, Morocco, uh, Turkey, and others are part of that forum. So they decided in, in 2012 to establish a center and the UAE offered to host it in, 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 uh, in Abu Dhabi. And this is why I became the chair of that uh, center. Uh, what we do actually, we do, we work with, with government actually. And what we do, through government, to, we convince them first that each country, they need to develop a national CB plan. And this uh, plan should be, should be based on prevention and holistic, where, you know, in many countries to counter terrorism, they use the, the security tool. We can't ignore that. We need the security agency to counter terrorism and extremism, but they are not, that's not enough. And if you engage education, religious leaders, community leaders, media, uh, judges, uh, legislator, you know, you will be able to engage all the stakeholders and to immune the whole community from these uh, terrorist ideology. So this is where we started uh, in Hidayah, working with countries and focusing on building their national capacity. And when I say national capacity, we work with teachers, uh, we work with uh, community leaders, religious leaders, judges, even the police. We talk, we train the police how to deal with, the, with those people. We talk even with the legislator. Uh, I'll tell you this story, but I will not mention the country. Once I was visiting a country uh, because they requested the help from the UAE related to countering uh, terrorism and extremism. So I went there uh, and I helped them put a plan. While I was there, I said, Ali, uh, because you are here, we have 
a new law to counter terrorism, and uh, it's already in the late stages of getting approval from our parliament. So we want to show you, you know, the good things that we are doing. So when they, you know, they made the presentation about the, their new law to counter terrorism, and I was smiling. When they finished the presentation, that said uh, their uh, special advisor uh, for uh, security there, he said, Ali, I saw you are smiling. Why? I said, well, I think you have a consultant from our friends in Europe who help you in developing this uh, law. They, everyone look at the others and they start laughing. So, how did you know? I said, because this law is built to protect the terrorist, not to protect the general public. Because you know what? They are saying, well, when you catch this terrorist, you have to provide him with this. Uh, the prison should be the, the space that he should have this. The medical services, he should get this and that. Uh, the food should be, you know, and it's all about showing him that he will be in a safe hand and he will get a five-star services in the prison. You know, these terrorists are, some of them are in jungles, you know, this is for them, it's, it's, it's a five-star hotel. <laughs> so I told them you are, you are promoting what you are doing to, for these tourists instead of countering tourism. And then they said, well, you are right. Because in their country, the tourists that they are confronting is in the, you know, is, is, is in the mountain and in the jungles. They don't have anything. When they catch them, they bring them this bed. <laughs> <laughs> and these excellent mattresses and you know five meals monitored by a dietitian and so they have an excellent service that they do they can get it within their organization so you know I'm, I'm giving this example to show that you know we in the UAE and through Hidayah we came a long way to understand the way that we have to counter terrorism and extremism this is why in Hidayah we were on helping uh, government to have a national CV plan and to build their national capacity. If they don't do so, they will not be able to counter extremism and terrorism. And before asking the uh, last question and then giving the, um, the uh, floor back to Sarah and to His Excellency for closing remarks, this follows exactly what you were talking about right now, that given the UAE's emphasis on mutual respect and tolerance, of the other, have other countries in the region approached the UAE covertly for guidance in establishing relations with Israel? Uh, look, we don't wait for others to come. You see, we we actually trying, you know, to to, to show the whole region, not only the government, uh, the, you know, the uh, those public uh, influential. Uh, public affairs uh, person, uh, public writers, uh, people working in the media, religious leaders, community leaders. We are working very hard, you know, to show them the added value of having peace with Israel. We are engaging in this and all what we do. It's, it's part of our mandate, wherever we go, that this Abraham Accord is part of agenda. If we go to China, if we go to the UK, if we go to South Africa or Brazil, it's part of agenda that, you know, we want, we want to promote the idea of, of the human value and that we all, as human beings, we need peace and we have to work and fight for peace. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ali. First of all, I'd like to tell you just how much we have in common, you and I personally. Um, part of the reason I started EMET 16 years ago was because I saw the tired, old, failed premises that American foreign policy was predicated upon um, and that it wasn't working. Um, and that, you know, just to, unfortunately, we do see a retrogression right now with the Biden administration and its voices such as yours that are so important. And you do um, 
we all have to just filter down the layers of what makes us truly human. And that's what you're doing. And I actually will like to talk to you when this is over, because for, for many decades now, I've been thinking of some ideas of how to get the region closer together. Um, and I, I, as it says, Hadaya is actually um, a Quranic source, the guide. And we can take the best, all of us can take the best of what we can of the religious sources. And um, as it says in the Quran, it says in the Talmud, that he who saves a single life, it's as though they've saved an entire world. And we are, can work together to save the world from these destructive negative forces of hatred. Um, so I, I find you wonderful, so inspiring. I can't thank you enough. And I too would love to be considered among your Jewish friends and invite you into our home for a Shabbat and, um, and into my daughter's home in Israel. And hopefully we could continue our friendship for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.